Though it may seem obvious, whenever a decision is made, a person has chosen to chase after its results. And when those results come to fruition, it is called consequence. Consequences can be placed under the separate banners of fortune or misfortune, depending upon the results and perspective of the events that transpire during the course of any choice that is made. It may seem almost trite to point this out, yet within the belly of the premise sits the very basis of the meaning of individual life and existence. That choice by its very nature creates division, and these separations in turn create the multitudes of channels that form the streams of variation that any person may rightfully claim as their personal story. This forms the foundation of the great mystery of all things. This is, as always, found directly in the word. Mystery is my story. The question that begs to be asked from this is, whose story is it exactly? Who is the one saying that this is my story? Is it the notion of God or a deity of some sort that is telling their story within the confines of this reality? Or, as it might be noted, is it simply a symbolic indicator, pointing to every single one of us as the characters within this all-encompassing story? A fractal whereby every individual is both the protagonist, yet also the potential antagonist for others who are also the main character from their own perspective in their own version of some type of great tale. The etymological roots of mystery contain a mist, which is based upon matters that are meant to elude our comprehension. It very much seems to be the point of this place, does it not? If everything was clear-cut and absent of any confusion, there would be no need for questions. Questions are the ionic quest, a quest ion, with ion being from the Greek root meaning I am going. The quest I on question is a place that I am going to find answers, and it is riddled with pitfalls, trolls, and ogres. The seeker of mysteries is constantly met by those who want to make their quest as difficult as possible. Why? Because big questions are long quests, and consequently the fruits of these journeys bring about the greatest possibility of answers that are truly treasures by any definition of the word. They are, by design, meant to be difficult journeys. The ones who blockade the quest towards anything bigger than what is presented by establishment thinkers prove that there is far more to everything than meets the eye, as the idiom goes. The fact of this is inherent to those who feel the breath of the mystical dragon upon their back, carrying their spirit towards ever higher summits that widen one's vantage point and bring about elucidation that would otherwise not be possible. Yet, one has to be dauntless in this pursuit of inward levity. Fear of heights keeps one tethered to the grounds that every gatekeeper holds the elusive keys to. There can never be interior prosperity when remaining shackled to the lower realms. One should also never be apologetic for moving beyond the constraints that have been set up all around them, and creating self-evolvement. Every beautiful quality that is held in the highest of esteem and honors is a grand journey. Loyalty is not bestowed through bloodline lineage. Honesty is not a birthright. Creativity is not handed down to anyone on a silver platter. Wisdom acquired through painful experience is rightfully earned. Inner qualities are a long journey that always start as the metaphorical block of stone akin to what Michelangelo used to carve the statue of David. Each of us is tasked to choose how well to carve out our own inner David, so to speak, and how far we are willing to go to help others do the same. One must build treasures in heaven. For what good is it to carry light and not bring it to those who remain in darkness? This is what the stars represent, the starry in my story, the lights of the heavens, the root of this can be seen in the Dutch word, which means the stars. As an anagram, it brings to us rest as a correlative towards those who move on from this realm and into the heavens, where they may rest in peace. The stars stare at us through our respective journeys, each star further symbolizing the seeds of new beginnings and a place of aspiration. Death, therefore, becomes an action of creation. 
Who among humanity at one point or another has not sought refuge in the great expanse above, looking for a voice in the depths to call back upon us? Yet no external voice from above is ever truly heard, because to be rescued defeats the entire purpose of any journey. Only in the trials does one learn. Determination and endurance are not earned because one is coddled. No master ever fell from heaven. Masters are built from the ground up. What does it mean to be a master? Certainly this connotes that one is a master over oneself, and not simply a ruler over others. Any fool can rule with a meter stick from heaven without having gone through hell first to get there. Any fool can be granted governmental powers and be tasked with the so-called responsibility of maneuvering the behaviors of a populace. It doesn't mean, however, that there is any rhyme, reason, or wisdom in the maneuvering being done. The question circles back onto those with this type of influence. Are they a master of themselves in any regard? The plain, simple, and observable fact of the matter is that not a single individual who has ever wielded this type of power in the public realm of this reality has ever been close to being a master of themselves and yet they all desire to manipulate and coerce entire populations into changing the world into a mold of their own distorted vision. If anyone wants to comprehend the basis as to why there will always be substantial problems in this material reality, this is one of the main root causes. Why is there such a rush to conquer other nations when one hasn't even conquered their own internal notions? The argument will undoubtedly be put forth that it becomes a lesser of two evil scenario, and that it's better to have someone even half capable steer the ship than to have no commander in chief at all. This line of thinking is actually defeatist, as it has been used since time immemorial, whereby nothing ever truly changes because of it. The central issue is not being looked at. What individual in what society is taught from their birth? to become a master of themselves in every sense of the word. It is obvious that the answer could easily be said to be none. Anyone can use their own life as an example, or anyone else that they happen to know, and realize that life is often a smattering of randomness, mixed in with a few recognizable patterns, to make it appear that everything is orderly and structured. These patterns formed by almost any society throughout any age has granted the human being the ability to believe an idea. The idea that everything in this reality in the current time period one finds themselves in is pretty much all figured out, and there is no reason to change the internalized order that has been bestowed upon the individual by their establishment instructors. Become a master? What in the world are you even talking about? That would be the generalized reaction to hearing all of this, often also peppered with mockery and ridicule. Another common can response towards those who are on the greater quest of life is, they must have done all of the drugs to be thinking like that. It may perhaps sound a bit disdainful, but it is best to simply move on from these types of conversations and interactions and not divert precious energy into those who simply seek to steer one away from their personal journey. It is always easy to fall again. Even after so much work is accomplished, one can still fall to great depths time and time again, and it is best to remind oneself of this fact often. The traps are not always so obvious either. Some may make the accusation that these works are one of those subtle traps. That's fine. If anyone feels this way, please move on. 
as the intention here is to never trick anyone into moving away from themselves and their self-discovery. This is why it is stated to unsubscribe from here and everyone else. To be a master means to bring yourself to the place where you follow no one. Instead, one should be far more wary of those who are the beggars of this world, wanting more and more followers, always displaying something new for sale as well. Why does anyone want so many followers? Where are all of these followers being led towards? Those who seek fame and adoration have quashed their opportunity to become their own master, for now they are completely occupied with the worship of others, and this in and of itself becomes their reward. There is a very large hidden price tag when it comes to this type of success, and it is almost never mentioned or talked about. When a person reaches a certain level of fame or recognition, they can never be certain if the people worshipping them are simply doing so because they are famous. It again becomes circular. The famous person is adored and worshipped because they are famous. It may also be pointed out that no one can themselves outwardly declare that they are a master. The master simply is, without the need to present it publicly. This is why the speaker is personally declaring no such thing either for those who are moving quickly towards the judgment gavel. How is one to discern what a master is then? Where are the points of comparison to draw upon? If there is a way for it to be discerned, should it not therefore be declared? This presents a paradoxical conundrum. Who is the master before the master? What is the baseline for the attainment of this state, if there can even be one? In the attainment of this state, would it not also be some declaration of perfection? What is perfection? This seems to be a meaningless term in the sense that any meaning can be placed upon it that one desires. Yet, are there not things that are actually better while others are worse? This is very much a property of subjective judgment, and it could be asked, who is the one doing the judging on that which is being deemed better or worse? When this line of questioning continues, it ends up going around in a circle and biting its own tail. This realization, however, contains within it a very significant revelation as related to the great question of one's personal journey. In every journey, no matter how far or how long, do I not just end up coming back to myself? Where is there to go? There is nowhere to go. Everyone I have met along the way was simply another variation or version of my own self, going through a different point on the so-called scales of time. Different experiences and different wavelengths of comprehension. On this expedition of life, what is it that I am trying to find? I am trying to find myself, am I not? If anyone was trying to find another, that is tremendously easy. There are others at every turn. But they are just as lost, trying to seek out something that gives their life ultimate purpose and meaning. However, very few would readily admit that they are lost, for this would destroy the egotistical construct of belief that holds the premise that one has basically got everything figured out. Humanity on the whole would much rather believe in the personality than find out who they truly are. Only when one loses themselves are they then able to find themselves. It is only when we have initially left ourselves that we became lost in the first place, and this started the endless succession of choices, variables, and the consequences of chasing after each one of those tales that has become the great mystery of my story. Where does each story lead? Nowhere, of course. Yet, it could also be said that the totality of these stories leads everywhere. Again, it is very paradoxical, because the story and the storyteller are one and the same. How does this all tie in to becoming a master over oneself? Within this reality, it is quite easy to get caught up in the drama that is created by personalities, which allows others to coerce and manipulate one's actions or emotional state. The individual must analogize themselves as being likened to a kingdom, and should anyone else be granted access to that kingdom, they are then allowed to wreak havoc upon it, should they so desire. 
the consequence being that there are Trojan horses everywhere. The easiest manner in which to understand this concept is to relate it upon the aspect of relationships. It can be that of family, friends, romantic partners, co-workers, or otherwise. Access to one's internal kingdom is granted through trust, which almost always leads to attachment in its various forms. When one allows others the power of emotional manipulation through these attachments, they have lost their sovereign power as the master of their own domain. It will undoubtedly be asked at this point, should one not create these forms of trust and attachment then? Or is it possible to do so and still become a master over oneself and the internal kingdom? When it comes to romantic relationships, is one not so often a beggar? Begging the other to please become attracted and attached to them. And when this exchange of begging is reciprocated in both directions, it is often labeled as love. Two beggars equally satisfied in the fact that the other involved in the relationship is equally unsatisfied existing by themselves, which creates a sense of security to remain attached to each other, often simply through the fear of being alone. This description will undoubtedly stir up a lot of contention, perhaps even hostility, because what is human existence for the most part except for the seeking of relationship and attachment? To negate this and call it beggarly is practically seen as sacrilegious. Those who react in anger are once again not listening to what is being stated. There is a very clear and defined difference between the individual that is a master of themselves and the individual that is not. To analogize it, does God beseech God? To whom does God look to for approval? If God is everything, then what is God in relationship towards? Itself and only itself? The idea is a circular absurdity and should be enough to prove the point that is being made. One's actions cannot be separated from their emotions. The emotions cannot be separated from the mind and the mind cannot be divided from the spirit. They are synchronous and synonymous regardless of an individual's recognition of that fact or not. To chase after something indicates that there is a lack of something within oneself, and this creates a choice and a story. The dog or the devil that chases after its own tail, endlessly going in circles, driven by the powers of desire to format attachments towards things that one feels that they are lacking. The crownless kings and queens of humanity, lost inside a dream of their own making, with no hope to escape because it is always believed that there is somewheres else to go, something else to attain. Who then can realize that the question itself in the story is the answer? Now where am I going? I am going nowhere. What can God chase except more God? But the chase is so much fun. There is so much adventure, and it really does seem to give purpose and meaning to it all, doesn't it? Sure, games can be fun. Things like organized sports can provide people with purpose and meaning as well. Our careers, goals, and ambitions. But look at where they all eventually lead. Don't blindly look, but look at it. Where does that fun foot race lead? Look past the so-called winning and losing of it all. Can it be seen? It's painfully obvious, and yet it remains entirely hidden. Beginning and ending are two aspects of the same coin, and it is the house that prints the currency. So long as there is an agreement to accept that currency and spend it, the race and the story continues unabated. So long as the heart remains attached to the relationship of this earth-heart realm, it keeps one tethered to the never-ending story inside of it. This last statement is in alignment with what is really meant by the exchange of beggars in relationship. Each one of us reincarnates back inside of that which we have become attached towards. Herein, however, is where a major conundrum lies. Does this mean that one disconnects completely and stops caring about everything? Quite to the contrary, in fact, which very much seems to contradict what has just been stated. It is again necessary to understand it from a different vantage point, 
a much more elevated perspective. Can care ever truly be divided? It seems on the surface that it can, but that is a ruse. Care as a pure quality down to its very essence can never be divided from itself. Care is care for all things, or it is not care. Can honesty as a pure quality ever truly be divided? There is either honesty or there is not honesty. Everything else is simply a diluted version of the quality being described, its value therefore becoming diminished. This brings up a most fundamental question. Can qualities ever be turned into fractions or degrees of themselves while still remaining true to their original state? The conclusion to this should be obvious. What of the quality called love, then? It should also be conclusive that if there is such a thing as qualities of any kind, then life and death are qualities, two sides of the same coin. Often, a quality of life is talked about, but what is never mentioned is the quality of death, not just as a moment of passing or the time directly leading up to this other side, but the entirety of the other side. If the coin cannot be separated from itself, would this not indicate that the quality of one's life must be in direct relation to the quality of their death? Would they not simply coexist as opposite planes of one another? Perhaps it has not been thought of before that there is as much attachment to those on the side of death as there is to those on the side of life. The polarities are magnetized towards each other. The issue being presented is that the one side is always blind to the other. Each side remains but half of its qualitative potential and is therefore relegated into a fraction of itself. The quality that is called life is fractionalized and thus so is the quality that is referred to as death and this creates a beggarly relationship between the two of them. This is quite easy to discern. On the one side, the pattern of humanity is constantly seeking out conclusions. It is constantly seeking out the so-called completion of things, life seeking its denouement. Once completed, the pattern reverses, and on the other side, there is a continual search for beginnings and starting points, death seeking its genesis. The circle must always complete itself. Is the pattern being seen? Is the greater realization of this reality being comprehended? The smaller actions of our individuality cannot be separated from the larger consequences of our reality. By seeking the pattern of constant endings, we are beseeching at the altar of death, and inversely, by seeking out continuous originations, we are but paupers at the altar of life. Should it be a surprise, then, that reality gives everyone more of what is desired in perpetuity? Life, then death. Death, then life. Genesis eventually leading to apocalypse, winter consummating into spring. An endless chase for the same things. It is for this reason that it should be seen now that a quality divided automatically creates its opposite. To have only a degree of trust or trustworthiness is to immediately sow the seeds of distrust. To feel love only for one's own group is to lay the groundwork that builds hate towards those existing outside of it. This same principle can be applied to anything that is defined as a quality of one's existence. A diluted God must by default create the devil. But isn't striving for this purity of quality an impossibility? We are but human, and we remain imperfect, susceptible to a nature that is inherently biased and prejudiced in so many ways. It is much easier to put on a mask of civility, and when the individual or collective commits either a small or egregious error, it can always be stated again and again, well, we are just human after all. Instead of legitimately working on correcting the issue, this seems to be a manageable and realistic trade-off. It is not seen that by relegating one's mentality into this realm, that man can continually be pitted against man. 
What divided nature can comprehend the totality of anything? Instead of unity, the mind sees pieces, and those pieces cannot comprehend that they are part of the same picture, not as a metaphor, but as a point of fact. Here it is put another way. The only love is self-love. The only hate is self-hate. The only war is a war against oneself. The only awareness is self-awareness. Apply this to everything. But it's obvious that there are enemies, right? So, if this is true, then why is it possible that I can hate myself while at the same time love myself? Again, the answer is in the question. Because you are divided against yourself. A singular force that has been cut into an infinite amount of pieces, unable to gather itself back together. Every individual is but a microcosmic example of the macrocosmic situation, albeit in varying degrees. The internal wars become the external ones and vice versa. This is why everyone can believe they are on the right side of things, because everyone is according to each of their own personal and divided perspectives. The game of politics plays into this perfectly, forever dividing the populace into separated camps, perpetuating an endless war of humanity versus itself. Current events, which are reflective of so many past examples, are simply another segment in the circle of time that takes witness to a higher degree of division and the escalation of negative principalities. Light is followed by darkness, and darkness precipitates the dawn. Why celebrate a victory over another? Another variation of yourself was on the losing side. What was there to celebrate? Congratulations, you just defeated yourself. It is time to uncork the champagne? Another year that we've gone in a circle? We had better set off the fireworks so the gods above can witness that they are still being honored from down below. How long must the journey continue on before this is realized? On an individual level, what can possibly be done about it? The general consensus is that what is being presented is a bunch of malarkey, and that reality is simply what has come about through eons of time as humankind struggles about on some kind of long, materialistic evolutionary highway. That the mind itself has also evolved and been able to create elaborate and even sophisticated theories to try and explain things about life that don't seem to make any sense. Instead, what is always stated is that the human being simply needs to trust the story that comes from establishment figures presented to them from the established scientific and governmental communities. All other viewpoints are to be seen as the conceptualizations of lunatics, drug users, and quacks. Remember, no matter what time period one finds themselves in, things according to the establishment is always all figured out. The establishment thus becomes a significant detractor that states everything that goes against the grain which appears to have correlation is simply a coincidence. That put side by side, the terms mastery and mystery have no relation whatsoever. You are just putting meaning into things where there is no meaning, it is said time and time again. To fall into that trap of thinking, however, is to believe the actual nihilists. It will no doubt also be contended that so-called outlandish theories create monstrous complexities over simple matters. It will be pointed out that so much is drawn from very little fact-based evidence, and only certain points are ever utilized in a piecemeal fashion to try and prove the theorem being presented. Cherry-picked information, it is proclaimed. That, however, is inherently the problem with absolutely everything, though, isn't it? What topic or point can ever be proven to be definitively factual with a never-ending quandary of material and evidence to counteract it? Truth, it very much seems, is only that which is self-evident. If I am in pain, then there is pain. If I am experiencing pleasure, then there is pleasure. Where is the argument to counteract these aspects? Yet, even here it seems there is no escape from potential detraction. 
Pain can be said to be just a creation of the mind. It's all in your head. Pleasure can be stated to be an over-exaggeration or a boasted claim. How to prove otherwise? This argument automatically infers the power of influence that one individual can also have upon another. If something is truly all in your head, then it can be surmised that there is a great probability that the seed from which one's mental landscape is created can be derived from the factors of external influence. Why else would things such as advertising be used so heavily if this were not the case? It would be wise from the perspective of health to meditate upon the correlation of these two terms, influence and influenza. They are related etymologically in case anyone cries out that it's just another coincidence. Also, not so random then that influenza is derived from the medieval Latin, which is to flow into, indicating an intangible fluid that is derived from the stars. Perhaps an intangible link to the ether, one might speculate. The mist starry deepens once again. How does this relate to one's mastery over anything? Why should one want to be concerned with this in any regard, or to care about being a master of themselves in any way? One might say they could care less. Just let me exist how I will in my own way, and live my life as I see fit. That's all fine, but it should be obvious that life and reality really doesn't allow this to happen for anyone now, does it? Current events again should be all one needs as evidence to prove this point. It should also be self-evident that when one is a master of themselves, they are no longer capable of being influenced by any outside factors. This goes for what could be deemed as positive or negative influence. When related to the absolute or that which is termed God, it can be thought through that if the absolute is all-powerful, all-seeing, and all-knowing, ever-present, then what could possibly influence God? God would be the ultimate example of mastery and nothing and no one could adjust, alternate, or manipulate even one iota of that source. This realization becomes a burden to a mind controlled by religious indoctrination, as it quashes the belief that actions such as prayer retain influence over a sovereign power. The contradiction becomes exposed. How can anyone influence that which is supposed to be completely and utterly neutral? If God or the Absolute is capable of being manipulated, this means that there is now a being that is susceptible to bias, division, and the capability of being corrupted. An all-powerful being that can be swayed through mental persuasion and the tactic of argument, or groups of people begging for external manipulation through the channels of mental petitioning. The one who can be swayed does not sound like a master. The one who can be manipulated in any regard resembles a human being, and so humans have believed in the type of God that resembles themselves, instead of one that seemed incapable of having any type of interaction with them. A neutral or impartial God? Who wants that? The people clamor for one that can help them win wars against their fellow men and women. The absolute is thus turned into a lord and the populace cheers on the circles of repetition that have created this grand world of duality whereby one must always choose a side, God or the devil. But the legitimate master, it seems, exists between these polarities, which is why this state is so often misunderstood and even despised by the human mind. Again, the current narrative has created another grand polarity which is manifesting a great divide amongst the populace. But it's impossible not to make a choice, isn't it? How can the individual become an unbiased observer when they are part of the whole schematic, a part of the society? It's easy to get caught in a story. It is far easier to be caught in a story that you're actually a part of. One is thinking about all of their emotions, attachments, and responsibilities. Then there are the consequences that go with making choice A or choice B. But when the choices have been laid out for you, it should be obvious that there really isn't choice at all. An abuser can say to their victim, 
choose between getting hit with my fists or with this baseball bat. That's not a choice. It is simply abuse of varying degrees. And so the victim has not changed the course of action that their abuser has already laid out for them. The choice itself is simply another integer in the equation of oppression. This is also why resistance is assistance. Humanity is used against humanity. Both sides create polarity, and this in turn creates continuity, and the battery cycle continues unabated. As long as there are sides and people believe they are making a choice which has been presented to them, they are playing into the hands of the abusers who have manufactured the entire scenario and the entire story. Politics and its games are a big part of the ruse. Choose this candidate or that one, but make a choice. The neutral master would simply say, I choose none of them, for none of them represent me or anything of me. The choice is again false as it always has been. To acknowledge external authority is to be a seeker of approval, and this produces an endless economy of slavery. What about help and assistance? Also, nobody exists as an island or knows how to do or accomplish everything. What is one to do? This should also be obvious in one's own actions. When you offer assistance, is it done freely without condition from the heart? Or does it come from that place which is desiring profit and advantage? Our intentions create the reality that is before us, and until such a time comes when the human species ceases to turn the heart into a dark machine of desire to profit over other pieces of itself, the cycle of duality we are experiencing will endlessly continue. The paradox is as painlessly simple and infinitely complex as that. We change things based on the intentions of our hearts. The beginning of this understanding must come from the realization that everyone and everything is a part of the same whole. It is unification that has become disassembled. So the purpose and the consequence of the mystery is for the individual to become unified in very much the same way the entirety was at one time. Individual mastery becomes collective mastery. One drop of poison can taint a glass of pure water, but one drop of pure water begins to dilute the glass of poison. Each of us becomes that which we feed, and in certain matters it is wise to fast, starve both wolves. Instead of constantly seeking to play into the paradigm of us versus them, perhaps it should be seen that one needs to work on their own individual unity. No one else is going to walk the lengths for you, and the promise of salvation was always a false one, created by the very same abusers who promise protection from their same hands that ceaselessly commit violence and atrocities of all kinds. The quality of their trust is about as diluted as it gets. They are the side of ourselves that have completely forgotten who they are. This is extremely difficult to discern when one has elevated themselves beyond the darkness. It is important to keep doing the internal work and to help others do the same. One day, though, they will be healed too. Until such a time, it is best to remind oneself on this great journey of mystery, there can be no winners or losers when there is just you. This world is testing the limits of the individual now more than ever. 
the pressure it is now being seen will only continue to escalate. How does one deal with the pressure? What are the solutions? Why is any of this even happening? These are big questions. And the problem with big questions is that the answers to them are going to be very different for everyone. As related again to health, this is why there can never be a one-size-fits-all solution to anything in life. The perpetrators of ill intent are trying to bend everyone's will towards a cattle line corral, one-size-fits-all solution, which will lead to tragic consequences. They are not human. It is felt that the true observer already knows and feels this to be patently obvious. As to the question of why this is happening, there could be a million reasons that anyone could come up with, but the fact remains, it is happening. Here I am, I am in this thing, and what are my responses going to be towards it all? It is realized that this is not what a lot of people want to hear. The human mind is conditioned to being directed, to being told what to do, how to do it, and when to do it. This can be a good thing up to a point. A person learns through guidance, which is the very basis of teaching. But at a certain point, guidance can be quickly converted into misguidance, deception, and betrayal. If the speaker told you all of the things to do, how to do them, and when to do them, could you trust with absolute certainty the advice being given? Why would anyone beseech the speaker for advice in this regard? This is why there is such an insistence on finding those answers within yourselves, because they have always been there and they always will be. No one needs to tell you what to do in the moment that you need to do it. It is the basis of what Krishnamurti called choiceless action, because when done from the very center of your being, the action is done perfectly in the moment and is the action that is called for in the situation that you are in. When one begins to live their life in this way with everything that they do, they then become the writer of their own story. One can then even become the true creator of their own destiny.